Hi, good evening and welcome to uh, the Government of Bermuda's Facebook channel. If you're watching on CITV, welcome. And if you're watching on YouTube, welcome as well. My name is Adaraka Batamosi Wilson and I'm the moderator for this evening's discussion about how the coronavirus uh, quarantine and um, the vaccination process. Joining me today, I have the Minister of Health, the Honorable Kim Wilson. Good evening, Minister. Welcome. Good evening, Anna Rocka. Um, we have the Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Ayo Oyenloye. Good evening, uh, Dr. Ayo. Good and we're also, we're also joined uh, this evening by the Director of Health, Mr. David Kandel. Hi, good evening and welcome to the three of you. How are you, David? Good, good evening, Adarake, how are you? Great, thank you. So what I would like to do is, Minister, I'd like you to um, open with a few words for us, please. Okay, thank you, and good evening again, everyone. Um, as everyone's probably aware, this third wave that Bermuda is currently experiencing is much larger, larger than any of our other previous waves, and we are seeing an alarming rise in the number of positive cases, and this is extremely worrying and very, very serious. We're trying to control the virus whilst we do the most important role at this point, which is vaccinating our residents. Once we have it under control, we can relax the restrictions, but not until we have it under control. So please, everyone, we are imploring you to do your part to help us to get this under control. And I cannot stress this enough, that if people are irresponsible and not extremely careful about their movements within our community, we will see further spread. This outbreak will get worse. Each of us has a role to play in stopping the spread of the coronavirus. Follow public health guidelines, wear your mask, practice good hand hygiene, maintain physical distancing, and download the We Health Bermuda app. If you haven't already, register to get vaccinated. Before we get into some questions, I wanna just highlight a couple key points um, that I think are really important and warrant repetition. Enthusiasm for the vaccine is increasing. We are seeing registration numbers continue to rise. However, fully immunized people can still get COVID-19, but they are at less risk. They will have be less ill and have mild symptoms or no symptoms at all. Vaccinated persons are better off than non-vaccinated persons because vaccinated persons will not get seriously ill. If you have been told by a friend or colleague do not wait until your contact tracers contact you. In other words, if a friend or colleague tells you that they are tested positive, don't wait until a contact tracer contacts you. Put yourself in quarantine immediately. If you are in isolation or in quarantine, you cannot go out in public and you cannot get COVID-19 tested until your day 14 test. Being released from quarantine is not a license to roam. Employers are not privy to your employees' COVID-19 results. If you require proof of quarantine, the Ministry of Health can provide a quarantine letter for you, or you can use your confirmation that's provided by the We Health, Health app. The safest thing now is to stay in your bubbles and avoid interacting with others unnecessarily. Do not go out if you do not have to. Do not have people in your home who do not ordinarily live in your home. Social distancing, wearing a mask and practicing good hand hygiene and getting vaccinated again are very, very important. Please exercise good judgment over this week Easter weekend. Stay in your household bubble at all times. If you're flying a kite, stay within your household bubble. Your household bubble comprises the people that you live with only, not everyone else. If possible, enjoy your kite flying from your property. If you are flying a kite, from a park or recreational area, stay within your household bubble. Do not mix with others at the same park. Do not visit with or invite others to your home. Don't visit your aunts, your uncles, or cousins, or friends. Do not mix at all. Even if you plan a family activity outdoors, I cannot stress enough, no mixing of households. This is how we're seeing huge amounts of transmission is the mixing of households. Continue to wear your mask, physically distance from others, and practice good hand hygiene again at all times, even if you are immunized. As I said earlier, being immunized does not mean that you cannot catch coronavirus. Be aware of your symptoms, which are easily associated with allergies, sore throat, tiredness, and headaches, coughing, and sneezing. And again, get vaccinated when it's your turn. Thank you, Anna Ronka. Thank you very much, Minister, uh, for that overview. Um, I'd like to invite David Kendall to give us um, a, 
information about how the We Health Bermuda app works. And we have some slides that David will speak to as, we, as he explains each aspect of the app. David, please go ahead. Yeah, sure. First of all, uh, for the We Health app, to be, this doesn't relate to this slide, so just bear with me. But for the We Health app to work, you need to have your Bluetooth turned on. And then what happens is, um, if your phone becomes in close proximity to another phone, and that phone is also running the We Health app, what they, the two phones will do is they, they actually pass what's called a token. They're anonymized tokens back and forth to each other. And this is just through the uh, Bluetooth signal. In addition, what the, the phones do is they measure uh, the length of time that the two phones are in contact with. And de depending on the strength of the Bluetooth signal, the two phones also know how close they are together. And um, so there's a few things going on there which can all then be put into um, then determining if one of those people or those, the owners of those two phones goes on to be tested positive and then um, sends out a signal after they are in touch with our contact tracing saying, guess what, David, say you tested positive. My phone will then send out um, signals to every phone and I don't know whose phones it will send it to, but every phone that it's been in contact with saying, hey, there's something up. So this is the first, um, so this is say, um, the chief medical officer and I have been close together, um, but not very close together. My phone might have sent him this. Now I wouldn't know that who has been sent this, but this is potentially the type of message that he might receive on his phone. It would just say, uh, dear IO, or it's, it's his phone, so it doesn't say dear IO, but it's saying, I look at this. It pops up as one of these notifications as you see on your phone. Uh, there's been a low, low exposure in the last 14 days. And then it just lets him know um, the exposure was not uh, near long enough uh, to recommend a quarantine, but it's just making you aware. And then it's giving you some links to click on. And that's what those blue arrows are to go and then educate yourself a bit more about getting vaccinated, how to stay safe, and also looking at the guidelines. So this is um, what I, either no notifications or this low exposure notifications are what you're hoping for, but I'll show you what you're not looking for is the next screen. So go to the next screen. So this is uh, not as good news. This is uh, worse news that your phone actually sets up a, a notification that says, uh-oh, um, I or you've actually had high exposure. It doesn't say to who, but again, it says in the past 14 days, and now it tells you, please stay at home and self quarantine. And it actually gives you a date so it gives you some information, um, very, very useful information. And then it says, if you have symptoms, continue to stay home and away from others. And that would mean even staying away from the others that are in your own home, wearing a mask in your own home, if you're gonna be close to them, things like not sharing a bathroom with them and really telling them, look, I've got this high exposure notification and I think I'm a close contact of a positive case. Then it actually provides a blue telephone. So you can very quickly just hit that and your phone will dial directly to our case management team who will then um, give you a lot more nuanced and detailed information. Or if you can't get through on the phone, you can click the other blue arrow there and that will allow you to then uh, send an email to our case management team again to get their more um, detailed advice. So if you go to the next screen, there's actually more information in the app. It will remember at the first screen, it said that uh, advise you because you had a close uh, contact to quarantine until April the 7th, but it also tells you when you are exposed. So you see it presents in this very easy to understand view um, that you are exposed to a positive case uh, on the 24th of March. And um, it's, it's uh, red because it was considered to be a high exposure. And if you go to the next screen, it actually tells you a little bit more about what this high exposure means. Um, so it says um, on between uh, 9 p.m. on the night of March 23rd and 9 p.m. on the night of March 24th. In other words, pretty well March 24th, unless you're out at night, you've been exposed to one or more people of high infectiousness for a total of 20 minutes. And it, it breaks it down. Now, it could have been a different number of minutes, but in the case of this particular um, slide, it's actually gone through and the phone has said, well, I was, um, your phone, David, was, or I, oh, sorry, in this case, was close to another phone, very close for seven minutes. Um, another eight minutes was at a close distance and five minutes was at a far distance. And this could be multiple phones, um, multiple contacts. But what it does is it adds them all up because what it's trying to 
um, the algorithm is trying to figure out what was the chance of you actually having COVID virus uh, come either on into your muco, um, mucous membranes in your, in your eyes if you weren't wearing glasses or even if you were wearing a mask or weren't wearing a mask, what were the chances that you've actually breathed in some COVID virus? And um, in that case, you are then considered a close contact uh, of, a, of a positive case and that you should um, be tested and you should be self-quarantining so that you know that whether this high exposure has actually ended up in you being a positive case yourself. And so that's the end of the demonstration. Are there any questions about this? The, Thank you, David. That, yeah, the advantage of this though, is this is a, you get this uh, very quickly in, right now we have a big outbreak. There's over 500 active cases. Each active case has between 10 and 20 close contacts. So our teams are, are stretched super thin and there are delays in them being able to get to every co close contact of every positive case. So this WeHealth app is a way to actually get something into people's pockets onto their phone and say, hey, alert, you may have had exposure to a positive person. It's not telling you that you are positive, but it's giving you some pretty good advice on now how not to spread a potential exposure to other people. Thank you very much, David. I just quickly looked at uh, Facebook comments. And one of the questions is, is the app retroactive? For example, if you were in close contact with someone before they test positive, will the app tell you? So um, I'm not 100% clear, but I have used the expression that it's not retroactive in that we're not, the, the worst thing you can, what you need to do, I'll tell you what you need to do. You need to download the app now. Um, it's no good downloading the app. Um, so it's not collecting the tokens unless the app is on your phone. So any uh, contacts you've had before you download this, load this app, it's not going to be able to function. It's only functioning after you've downloaded the app and it's created this history of 14 days of these various interactions phone to phone, keeping these uh, tokens only locally. None of these tokens go any, on any server. They're only on the phone itself. So um, what you don't want to do is um, actually be one of those people who probably uh, finds out you're positive and then thinks, oh, if I download the app now, I, it will send out to everybody that I've been in contact with because it won't, it, it won't function like that. Uh, it's only if you download it now before you're exposed. Um, so retroactively has very little value. So please download it now before you're exposed. And thank you, David. And just to remind people that the app is free. You just need to go to the App Store or Google Play, uh, put in We Help Bermuda, and um, you'll be able to download the app. And you don't have to uh, think about it again after, after that. The only time that it will nag you is if you turn off your Bluetooth uh, signal, and then you'll get alert. And it will say to you, do you realize that you, uh, your app is downloaded, it's on your phone, but it's no longer functioning to actually track these interactions. Um, do you want to turn your Bluetooth signal back on um, so that, the, so it actually is, uh, it's giving you a good reminder <laughs> if you inadvertently turn off your Bluetooth. Okay. So that, yeah. All right, so the person that asked the question, um, their thought is uh, it does keep a 14 day history. And so that's what, that's the question that they were really asking. David, thank you so much for your time today and um, have a safe holiday weekend. Thank you so much. All you right. too, all the best, bye-bye. So, uh, bye. Uh, so Minister, um, Dr. Ayo, I want us to now go to the questions that we received earlier uh, uh, this week uh, from people who were on social media. And as we go on, I'm gonna remind those who are watching on Facebook, if you have questions, put it below the, um, the video and we'll come to your questions. So let me get started. Um, Dr. Ayo, do you think we will get to a 70% 70, 70 vaccination rate? What happens if we don't? And actually that's for both of you, um, Dr. Ayo and you minister. Okay. Minister, do you want me to go first? Uh, sure, that's fine, Sema. <laughs> All right, okay. Right, so I think we will get to 70% um, uh, vaccination rate. Um, as the minister mentioned in her statement, um, more and more people are beginning to change their minds about this vaccination and they are 
um, choosing actively to get vaccinated. Um, the outbreak that we've uh, had on Ireland is also um, focusing minds and focusing people's attention on what could go wrong. And therefore, I'm confident that we will get to uh, a 70% vaccination rate. Um, what happens if we don't? Um, basically, what the, the what happens is, is that we would not have the protections uh, and the certainty that when uh, this infection comes into our uh, community, it will not meet dead end infections. That means that we will still be having outbreaks and, uh, God forbid, potentially hospitalizations and even deaths if we don't get that. Okay, thank, thank you. Um, Minister, did you want to add a thought? Yes, thank you. Um, I, I, I agree. I share the sentiments of um, the CMO. I think that we will get there. I think more and more residents are recognizing the importance of the vaccine and that them becoming immunized is not just for themselves. It is to assist to ensure that their families, their loved ones and the overall community are also um, protected when we all reach herd immunity. So I think that people are realizing by me getting the, vac the vaccination, it's not just to provide immunization to me and protect me, it's to protect the wider community and those persons that I live with. So another question from Facebook, uh, what therapeutics are available on the island for COVID? <clears throat> okay, so um, a, a couple, uh, that's probably a, a question best answered by my colleagues in, in the hospital, but I'll, I'll have a go at it. So um, dexamethasone is what has been proven um, uh, to actually reduce um, hospital stay um, and reduce deaths uh, from um, COVID-19 in hospitalized patients and people who are ill from that. Uh, we also have remdesivir, which is basically an antiviral um, that works uh, against this um, virus and has been shown to cause hospitalization stay um, in, in, in hospitals. Um, in addition, um, we also have um, convalescent plasma, which is basically uh, the parts of the blood um, that um, contains the antibodies that is helpful in um, fighting this virus. So that's also available on island. Thank you very much. And we have uh, another question from online. Um, why do we need vaccination after getting COVID? So if somebody has tested positive, they've recovered, why do they still need to get the vaccine? Okay, um, the, the immunity you get from vaccines is superior to what you get from natural infection. It lasts longer, persists longer, covers a wider variety of um, virus than what you get from um, the natural infection. And for example, we know of at least two cases of people who've been previously infected with the wild type virus um, uh, earlier on in the year, who now have tested positive with this new um, B117 strain of virus. So you can get a new strain of virus if all you're relying on is your natural immunity from one strain of virus. Thank you very much. Um, Minister, I think this question may be for you. Could you release the vaccination results daily? More data, the better. Uh, that is a, a really good question. Um, we do release them on a weekly basis. Um, the, the principal rationale behind that is that we operate in what's called an epi week. Uh, so it runs for a seven day period. So from an epi epidemiological perspective, the data and the statistics, including vaccination data, is calculated on a weekly basis so that we can monitor trends and the like. It, it helps with respect to further analysis. So at this point, um, it may be something we can consider in the future, but at this point, we're doing it on a consistent epidemiological week so that we can better analyze uh, the results of not just the vaccinations, but also the other things that we collect on a weekly basis. But that is certainly something we can explore, yes. Thank you, Minister. Um, where can we get antibody testing done? Um, question is, why would you want to have antibody tests? Um, it's a very, very difficult test to interpret um, and its um, uses is basically con uh, confined to um, population level studies and also for the hospital to identify people who can give 
um, the appropriate blood samples uh, for uh, I, I don't know for as a prelude to say donating for uh, convalescent plasma. For the vast majority of the public, it's not a very useful test because it's quite difficult to interpret. There's so many things to consider with it. So we're not making it available widely because it's not very useful. Thank you very much. I have another question from uh, Facebook. Is the herd immunity 70% of the eligible population or total population, as the total population technically can't get vaccinated if they are younger than 16? That, that, that's a very good question. Um, the 70% uh, needed for herd immunity is the total population because the total um, everybody in this population is um, potentially susceptible to this virus. So we need everybody to be uh, vaccinated. But um, the vaccines um, that we have on Ireland are not licensed for use um, in children younger than 16. So that means we need to have a higher proportion of people aged over 16 vaccinated to get us to that 70% um, figure. Thank you. <clears throat> it was stated in a previous press conference that persons should wait three months before getting the vaccine if they tested positive for COVID. If for those registering and walking in to get vaccinated, do they need to show the, the negative at the time of receiving the vaccine? Uh, no, they don't. Um, what we need to um, know is that at the, the, the information and the knowledge evolves with this vaccine. So at the time when we uh, when the guidance was wait after a positive um, uh, diagnosis before getting vaccines was because the, the thinking at the time is that um, you have some level of protection, albeit not as good as what you get from the vaccine, and therefore want to prioritize people who have no protection um, for to get the vaccines. Um, experience have now taught us that um, the immunity you get from the vaccine is superior to what you get from natural infection. And the only criteria we want now is that you don't have an active disease. Um, and we'll be happy to um, schedule you for vaccination. Thank you. Um, can you please explain what 95% efficacy means with the Pfizer vaccine? Okay, so this is about the reduction in, in um, uh, the risks of getting uh, uh, COVID after you've had the vaccination. So if we um, if we had um, two groups uh, of 100 each, one group completely vaccinated, another group um, completely uh, uh, not vaccinated at all. What these um, trials have shown us is that, um, uh, it, say if 20 people go on to develop um, serious disease in, in um, the arm that is not vaccinated, uh, would they only expect one person in the arm that's vaccinated to develop serious di disease? So there is a 95% reduction in the risk of people developing serious disease. So it's a reduction in risk of developing um, um, serious disease from uh, uh, by getting vaccinated. Okay. So um, I have this question uh, and uh, I'll use the number that the person asked the question with just so that you understand. So if the current 474 active COVID cases should tragically die in some bizarre accident scenario, would those numbers be added to the worldwide COVID deaths figure? <laughs> okay. 
uh, that's a very cynical person, uh, but that's fine. Um, okay, so no, what, what the way it is is that the 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 way we report our COVID deaths is that the the person um, should have a, a, a an active diagnosis of COVID, and the cause of death is likely related to um, the COVID nineteen infection. So if if uh, someone has COVID and unfortunately gets hit by a bus, um, that is not recorded as a COVID death. But if they had a, a, a heart attack, or uh, sorry, if they had a, a pneumonia from the COVID and the COVID then precipitates a cardiac arrest, that that is a COVID death. Okay, thank you. Um, Minister, um, I think this question may be for you. Are we going to include more conversations on how our community can live a healthier lifestyle in addition to how those without insurance or um, low income can get access to adequate health care? Uh, yeah, those conversations do, do continue. You would note that one of the um, uh, uh, throne speech initiatives, as well as one of the platform pledges by the PLP, is for us to have universal health care and to move towards an integrated health system, which we recognize will not only um, reduce the cost of health care, but also provide for those persons that are underinsured and uninsured um, the proper uh, primary care, medication, et cetera, et cetera, that persons need um, to be healthy and to remain healthy. Um, unfortunately, we pivoted a little bit from the last year having to address um, uh, the pandemic. However, that is still a number one priority of this government and certainly my priority. And we are moving um, towards this integrated system and members of the public will continue to hear more as things unfold. So that priority still remains a commitment of the PLP government. Thank you, Minister. Um, I have another question. Are you looking for more people to assist with contact tracing? Um, what qualifications do you need? Okay. Dr. Maya, do you want to take that one? Yeah, yeah, I, I'm happy to. Um, yes, we do need, um, uh, we do, we're, we're always uh, looking out for people who can help us um, manage uh, and, and do contact tracing. Um, that's a, a, a need that we always have. Um, there's some constraints around, uh, um, how much training we are able to offer while we're trying to manage a pandemic. But um, nevertheless, we're looking for people. And what we're looking for is ideally people with um, a health background, um, people ideally who are sufficiently numerate and who have uh, the good interpersonal skills that will allow them to be able to um, speak to people, get the right information and, and give the right um, messages to uh, people who may be positive or their contacts. Thank you very much. Um, quickly looking to see. So um, I have this question. What should I do if I haven't received the COVID testing results done on March the 29th in pop-up testing location at TCD? Uh, that was Mondays, I believe that was Mondays. Yeah, pick up the phone and speak to your doctor. Um, your doctor has access to the uh, system that collates all of the information um, and they will be able to tell you uh, what the situation is. Um, the other thing to mention though is uh, 29, you said. Yes. All right, so that, that doesn't, that's not relevant. If, if you've not got your results, pick up the phone, speak to your doctor. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I think this may apply to the WeHealth Bermuda app. When do they give the code to people that have been tested positive for the virus? David wants to take that? No, David's gone. Oh, so, right. Okay. Um, All right. So go ahead. Go ahead, Dr. Ayo. Yeah. If um, uh, when people become positive, uh, encouraged to, uh, as part of the, um, contact tracing, they are asked if they have the app on their phone and they are given uh, a code um, to put on their phones uh, to indicate that they have tested positive and that, that um, code then does all the things that David described it to do. So that's the stage where they're given the code. Okay, thank you. Um, Minister, I think this uh, question um, is for you. My family and I have been trying to speak with anyone at the COVID number, and I've had no answer several times this week. Are you short-staffed? 
Hi, uh, actually we, I wouldn't say short staff is the challenge. The challenge that we have is that we have, of course, been inundated with uh, hundreds and hundreds of calls. I think Tuesday alone from uh, 9 a.m. till almost 12 p.m., they had 1,300 calls. So we are receiving quite a lot of calls um, from members of the public uh, that have questions concerns, uh, wish to book appointments, et cetera. We always try to encourage persons that if you wish to book an appointment to go online, because that is a quicker mechanism for booking an appointment for either the vaccine or for a COVID test. Um, there have been some challenges with respect to the phone system. We are getting a new phone system installed this weekend, actually, that will be able to facilitate more trunk lines, I think is the technical term, but in any event, that will be able to help uh, with a smoother transition uh, with respect to the um, operations of the telephone lines. So that is being installed this week and we, this weekend, excuse me, by the time we finish training and so forth, we're anticipating within a week or so that we'll be able to have that system operational. But again, we're just asking members of the public to be patient. Um, again, uh, people can call for appointments and so forth, but you can also do that online. So if, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot easier. You can have to imagine that the uh, COVID hotline does receive a lot, they get questions as to when is trash pickup. I mean, they do get a lot, a myriad of questions that are not generally COVID related. So you, you can appreciate the volume um, of calls that they get, particularly when we're in an outbreak and I have to commend them because obviously they're answering the phone with patience and diligence, but we're also asking members of the public to also exercise a little bit of patience um, to uh, when they're trying to get through the hotline. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Minister. Um, Dr. Ayo, uh, how does the vaccine affect our innate immune response versus our adaptive immune response? Oh, okay. Um, that's uh, quite a technical question. So the innate in immune response is the sort of um, protection that our, our body is able to give to um, expel any um, potential uh, virus or bacteria that comes into our body. So the sort of things that we're talking about is the, your skin is a barrier to any infection getting to your bloodstream, for instance, the um, acid in your stomach is a barrier to you ingesting anything that causes you problem. The mucus in your airway traps some of the, the uh, viruses or, or, or um, bacteria then they can then expel those so that's innate and and it's it's quite uh um it's non-specific to anything what the vaccine does is that it trains your body to be able to identify parts of this virus and allows your body to develop a and antibodies to it as specific um proteins in your system that identifies part of the um virus and respond to it. And the other way, the other mechanism it does is to trigger what is called the T cells. And these T cells, um, after your, the, the, your body gets rid of the antibody, they have a memory, they can remember this for years to come. And then if you get um, exposed to the virus, those T cells can be activated and give you protection, uh, uh, get your body to, to um, attack this virus. So that's the way it works. So the vaccine is not in the um, it's not in it in immu immunity. It stimulates active immunity, not passive immunity. Thank you. Um, I have another question. Um, if someone has been fully vaccinated and they are classified as a close contact of a positive case, do they need to quarantine for 14 days since they are a low positive. The CDC says quarantine is not required if one is fully vaccinated and they display no symptoms. Okay, I, I've answered this question in many ways in the last two weeks. Um, the first thing to say is we're uh, an independent jurisdiction. We're not part of America. And therefore we would need to make um, uh, guidance that reflects our own peculiar situation. So when you have been asked to quarantine after uh, you've been exposed to a positive case, it's not necessarily to protect you. We've already said that the vaccine reduces your risk of any serious illness. So you're not likely to get very seriously ill that we're worried about. The reason why we're asking you to 
to quarantine is to protect others. We have still have a significant part of our vulnerable population on this island who are not yet vaccinated and are at risk of getting severe illness and God forbid death. So what we're trying to avoid here is um, you passing this virus on to a vulnerable person and, and um, the poor sequelae that can happen from that. It's also what new, um, noteworthy to note that it's only the US um, that has this policy at the moment. Israel that has um, probably the world's best vaccination rates hasn't followed the same line. So that, that should tell you something. Thank you, uh, Dr. Ayo. Um, I have another one. Um, please, can you clarify why teachers are having to quarantine for 14 days rather than following government's guidelines of wear mask, avoid the three C's after, after what can be described as a casual contact at most. So to help for, with clarity, um, this is following spending 10 minutes in a well-ventilated classroom while all present were wearing masks and physically distancing with one student who was subsequently tested positive. Uh, okay, I, I don't know the specific um, instance that the, uh, the question relates to, but what I know is that um, my colleagues in the cocktail tracing team and in the epidemiology and surveillance units would carry out a risk assessment. So if you've been asked to quarantine, it's because they've evaluated your risk and they think that you are a close contact. Um, this is, it's not done flippantly, it's done with a lot of care and consideration. So if that's, if you have been asked to quarantine, please take heed to what they're asking you to do and please quarantine. Thank you. Um, will the guidelines for vaccinated travelers to Bermuda be relaxed when the number of vaccinated residents reaches 70%? We, we are reviewing the guidelines as it relates to vaccinate immunized persons um, very regularly. Uh, as you can appreciate, that is a hot topic for persons that are um, immunized. However, if we when, when Bermuda reaches 70% herd immunity, uh, we will have quite a lot of uh, 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 lesser restrictions on those persons that are immunized because we would have met our goal and objective of having herd immunity and having uh, best protection against those persons that are vulnerable within our society. As the CMO just um, indicated, persons that are immunized, that's great for them. But if there's other persons that are not immunized and are more medically vulnerable um, and they contract the virus, because again, the evidence does, is, is still out, insofar as whether or not an immunized person can transmit the virus to other persons. So it goes back to the point that I made previously in that the vaccination is not just for you, it's to help protect the whole community. So once we reach herd immunity, then we'll be able to have a lot more freedoms and restrictions lifted, particularly for those persons that are immunized because we will better protect the whole community. Thank you, Minister. Uh, are there any developments with regard to the travel passports for both arrivals and departures? Uh, as I understand it, uh, that is still, we are certainly working on that because as you can appreciate, almost every nation in the world is grappling with something that is a, um, a, 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 a procedure that allows for you to actually prove uh, a credible uh, production of some type of person's status with respect to immunization. Uh, the premier has indicated previously that they are working through uh, the ITO department and I believe that they are anticipating a um, rollout of a particular uh, app, uh, certainly by the middle of May. Thank you. So do you have to be vaccinated if you are looking to work with the contact tracing team? Um, no, it's not mandated at the moment, but we certainly would encourage that. That, that um, yeah, we would want people who um, have our values and understand the risks so that when they're communicating this risk, they're able to do that in a, an informed um, way and that uh, we'll be able to, if necessary, share personal experience, if that's appropriate. Um, what, if any, 
are the long-term effects being seen of persons who have recovered from COVID-19 locally? Um, so this is a question that needs to go to my colleagues in the hospital. They are, they are looking at this. I did ask um, the chief of medicine about this, and he's told me that he's been called on um, a lot of general practitioners have um, asked for his opinion um, on several cases of what is colloquially called long COVID, which is basically persistent symptoms after COVID infections on island. Uh, but it's not something that we are actively surveying for at the moment, so can't give any numbers on that. Uh, our next question, why isn't it made possible that the parents of children who have to quarantine are not tested at the same time? I'm not sure I understand the question. Uh, so I think they're saying if children are tested, why aren't the parents tested? And they have to go into quarantine. Why aren't the children tested at that time? Why aren't oh, the parents right. tested at that time? All right. OK, so, yeah, I, I think the, the issue uh, for us is that um, when we set up a pop-up test, for instance, in the school, um, uh, they're usually um, limited spaces and the priority for us at that point in time is the students and the teachers in that school and the staff in that school. Um, we also we, we would certainly encourage the parents and any other household contacts um, of a positive case to go to a pop-up um, um, to go to, uh, to book online and get tested. Um, however, the priority is for um, the pupils and the staff of the school. Okay. Uh, another question from Facebook. I registered for the vaccine on March the 21st. No call for an appointment as of yet. What guidance do you have for that person? Um, I would invite them to, if they register, I, I don't know if they registered uh, online or if they made a telephone call for the uh, for the registration, but it was just, you said March 26th? March 21st. March 21st. So it, 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 it was relatively recent and I would anticipate that they should be hearing something from the um, vaccine center uh, very shortly uh, because they did just register. However, if they don't hear anything, perhaps by the next, uh, by midweek next week, then perhaps for them to go ahead and go back to, I would invite them to go back to that email address and um, send their query and indicate what, what you've just mentioned to me as uh, their dates and times when they registered. Thank you. Um, Dr. Ayo, uh, what is your stance on the use of ivermectin? Ivermectin. So I was gonna say, forgive me for uh, <laughs> not getting that right. Okay. Um, zinc vitamin C and D as a treatment for COVID? Oosh, okay. There's um, four different therapeutic agents that you've mentioned there. Um, okay, so I'll, I'll tell you what has been proven not to work. Um, vitamin D um, and a vitamin C uh, have been proven not to work as therapeutic agents uh, for COVID. Zinc is a useful adjuvant um, to treatment because zinc um, modulates quite a few of the body's um, uh, response to uh, developing immunity against viruses. So it, it might be a useful adjuvant to treatment, but not certainly not on its own. And the final thing is ivermectin, uh, which is basically uh, uh, antiparasitic is usually used by um, humans for things like river blindness and used by horses and, and dogs to clear parasites. Um, in the lab, it, it, it um, inhibited the growth of um, uh, uh, COVID-19 virus. Uh, however, in um, real life studies, uh, the results are a lot more mixed. So there are some small trials that show some benefits and others that don't show um, any benefits. So at the moment, there's a big trial going on in the United Kingdom that we're all looking for um, 
the results from that trial to tell us uh, with the right sample size if this is actually a very good treatment uh, method or not. Okay, thank you. Uh, Minister, this question is directed to you. Uh, is there an exemption for short duration travel with regard to, let's say, a weekend trip that doesn't allow for time, uh, time for testing and a receipt of results before returning home? Will the person still be penalized $300 for not having results? Uh, I can answer that in two ways. Uh, as I understand, there are some insurance companies that are paying that $300 if individuals have to go away for emergency medical treatment. If a person, if that doesn't apply to that individual, um, uh, there is a $300 penalty. Um, if you're going away for, like I said, emergency medical treatment, oftentimes the insurance company will cover that or alternatively the facility that you are having the treatment there, the hospital, the medical facility, whatever, will provide the tests for you in it to enable you to travel. However, unfortunately, uh, we've implemented that procedure since I think it was in December that if a resident returns to Bermuda without a pre-arrival test, then they will have to incur the sum of $300. Thank you. Um, how do Bermuda doctors report and to whom do they report adverse effects of the vaccine? Dr. Aya? Yep, so that's, um, we have a, an adverse event reporting mechanism. Um, that's a form that um, uh, GPs and um, primary care doctors fill and send to the um, epidemiology and surveillance unit, and that's investigated um, to determine if that adverse event is or uh, related to the vaccine or not. Okay, thank you. Um, what symptoms are being reported other than sore arm at the injection site, fatigue and headaches and flu-like symptoms? I'm assuming this is for um, somebody who's taken the vaccine. Um, I think we, we've, we've seen uh, quite a few of um, uh, the symptoms that have been described in the literature. Um, it's... Um, there's quite a lot of um, reports of sore arm, as you said, flu-like illness, some tummy upsets, occasional uh, lumps in the uh, in the axilla, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, but um, at the till date, we have not identified any serious um, adverse event linked uh, that has a, a clear link to the vaccine. Okay. Um, Minister, this may be for you. Was there any consideration given to further restricting occupancy, occupancy at dining restaurants as opposed to eliminating indoor dining altogether and softening the economic impact on owners um, on their businesses, of these businesses? Uh, there were um, many uh, factors that uh, Cabinet considered as it related to the eventual rollbacks for the most recently um, announced regulations. Certainly that was one of the factors. Uh, there were a number of things that were discussed. It was a very lengthy discussion concerning the regulations because we recognize the potential economic impact on um, restaurants in particular uh, where they are required to uh, uh, no longer be permitted to serve uh, indoors. However, bearing all things in mind and recognizing the situation that we see ourselves in, uh, the cabinet made the decision uh, to close the restaurants for indoor dining for the time being. Uh, I think this is a great segue to allow me to get on my soapbox for a moment because you know it is unfortunate because I recognize that there are restaurants that are adversely affected as are many other individuals. We've got over a thousand people that are in quarantine as a result of activities of a few individuals who chose to ignore the public health guidelines and you know, celebrate, party, do whatever, um, which is causing the uh, severe outbreaks that we're seeing right now. This outbreak that we have now, not, notwithstanding that it's a more transmissible variant, we have far more positive cases than we've ever had in Bermuda. This is the worst outbreak that we've ever had. And all of this would have been, could have been avoided had persons taken respons personal responsibility for themselves and their actions and considered others and the impact 
it would have on others, not just economically, but potentially physically as well. Thank you. Um, why isn't it mandatory to quarantine for 14 days when coming uh, to Bermuda from travel? After traveling? Uh, the Again, based on uh, a, a lot of information that was coming to the cabinet that we had at our disposal, principally from uh, the Ministry of Health, it was decided that persons that arrive in Bermuda, uh, save for outside of the United Kingdom, because as you appreciate, if you're coming in from the United Kingdom, there is a um, mandatory four days quarantine. However, because we have such an aggressive testing regime for persons, the best way... COVID can't float here. COVID has to come through the airport. So the reality is, or through our ports. So we have very, very aggressive testing regime and we recognize that we must stop COVID at the border. So that's why there's a requirement for all non-residents that enter Bermuda, they have to have a pre-arrival test that's no, no older than 72 hours before they arrive. They have to test on arrival. They have to test on day four. They have to test on day 10 and test on day 14. So we do have an aggressive testing regime to try to prevent COVID from um, coming into our shores. However, if it does get here, we continue to test so that we can test and isolate and minimize the impact that it would have um, on our community if COVID entered through our borders. So we have a very strong border protection as it relates to identifying and addressing COVID. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question from Facebook, what is the efficacy of the Pfizer vaccine on the UK, South African and Brazilian variants? Okay, so um, some of the, um... The first thing to say is that the trials that was conducted on the Pfizer vaccine was done before any of the variants of concern that you've mentioned were identified. So um, that, that we don't have um, we don't have trial data to support that. Um, however, there's uh, other ways we can extrapolate the data, and that is basically by using the antibodies generated after you've had this va vaccine and see how it reacts to, with, um, with uh, this variance of concern. So um, what the manufacturers have been able to show, and there's some real world data to back this up, is that this vaccine is um, efficacious against the strain from the UK, that's a B117 strain, um, less so for the strains from Brazil and the strain originally detected in South Africa. Um, it's not zero, but it's not as good in those strains. Okay, thank you. Do returning residents have to wait until day 14 negative test results before being able to get vaccinated? Correct, yeah, that's correct. Yes, that's, that's, that's the um, requirement at the moment. Will people have to be vaccinated every six to 12 months going forward? Uh, nobody knows the answer to that yet. <laughs> um, what a lot of people are suggesting is that similar to the flu, you might need to have a booster on an annual basis to uh, when uh, we identify any new variants of concern and have a booster that, uh, that better targets those variants of concern. But that's still hypothesis at this stage. Nobody knows for certain. What happens with children under 16 returning from overseas who cannot be vaccinated, but the adults that have traveled with them are vaccinated? Do the children have to quarantine? Uh, yes, um, at, the, at this point in time, you will need to follow a traveler continuum um, because they can't be, um, they cannot be vaccinated at this stage. Mm -hmm. um, what happens if someone has um, been potentially exposed to the virus, refuses to get tested? Well, the quarantine regulations um, gives the office of the uh, chief medical officer um, broad powers to be able to compel people to get tested. And if people refuse to get tested in spite being um, 
told about the requirements under the law, they can be charged to court and they could get um, prosecuted and fined. Thank you. Um, I'm conscious of our time. It is now 5.55. And so um, I think maybe we have enough time for maybe one, maybe two more questions, and then we'll go to wrap up. Um, when will walk-in vaccinations be available again? Actually, we um, announced just the other day uh, that starting on Monday at the Bermuda College, from 8 a.m. until 9 a.m., we will be doing walk-in vaccinations for those individuals that are 65 years and over. Uh, what we certainly don't want is the uh, lack of technology to be a barrier. We want no barriers for persons to get immunized, especially those individuals over the age of 65. So at the Bermuda College, starting on Monday from 8 till 9 a.m., the walk-ins will be made available for any individuals over the age of 65. Thank you. And um, I think this is potentially our last question. What has been the approximate recovery time for the COVID UK variant? Um, no, I have not looked at that sp specifically, but um, it's not much different from uh, the wild type virus. So within most people recover within 14 days. Um, uh, yeah, for most people, that's, that's the, the, the recovery time. Thank you. So I'd like to give you both an opportunity uh, to wrap up. Uh, Dr. Ayo would like to go first. Any final thoughts? Well, it's just to say uh, to, to you Bermudans and, and residents of this uh, great country that we are going through uh, a very serious outbreak at the moment. And as you heard the minister, this is the worst we've ever seen. Um, the only way out of this is for us all to follow the rules. Um, if you have been um, identified as a contact, please stay at home, stay away for 14 days. I know it's not easy, but you're not just doing it for yourself, you're doing it for this country. Um, it, please wash your hands, wear your masks, um, avoid crowds, stay in your homes as much as possible and avoid mingling with people indoors from other households. Um, avoid that as much as possible. And crucially, the way out of this pandemic is by vaccination. If you have not yet been vaccinated, please register to get vaccinated. That is the way out of this pandemic. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ayo, Minister. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Anna Ranka. I think, you know, Bermuda, Bermuda and our residents have always proven to be a very benevolent society. And I would encourage us to continue with that um, uh, attitude. We need to follow the public health guidelines. We, uh, as we've said, as the CMO just said, this is a horrible outbreak and we want to preserve our resources for what is most critical right now, which is to in, um, continue the immunization program and our strategy. Uh, we are uh, seeing uh, a huge spike, and we know that this, this, this particular variant is extremely transmissible. And so with that regard, we need to make sure that in order to minimize the impact of that, that we follow our public health guidelines, remain in your bubbles, wear your mask, physically distance, et cetera. I know it sounds like a broken record, but that's the only thing that's going to help us to um, uh, curve this uh, particular um, situation that we're seeing ourselves in now, we can get through this. And the sooner that we get our society immunized and we reach herd immunity, and we need our resources to be able to do that. And unfortunately we're tied because we're using resources to do contact tracing when, you know, just six weeks ago, we weren't in this situation and we would have probably been further ahead with respect to our immunization. But in any event, we're making really good progress. I'm certain that we will reach herd immunity. And once that happens, we will see a lot of restrictions. We'll be able to go inside in a restaurant and eat. And there'll be a lot of other restrictions that will be lifted. And we will be able to have a relatively normal summer once we reach herd immunity. So in order to do that, we need everyone to play their part. Thank, Thank you. you both very much. And um, I hope you have uh, a good Easter weekend. Thank you very much for your time. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Thanks, Anaranka.